Hello, 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 and welcome to this Blueprint Med School Tutors webinar. I am so excited that you guys and gals have decided to join Dr. Trainer and myself this evening. We're going to do uh, we're going to do tox. Uh, the title of this webinar is Tox and the Hound. All the tox fit to print because, and all of us have taken all our steps by now. They love tox for some weird reason. It's everywhere. The antidotes, uh, the management and step two and three, it's a very high yield area that in my opinion, doesn't get the love um, that some of the other systems. So Dr. Trainer, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Michael. I'm a second year neurology resident. I've always liked toxicology. I think the, the field of neurotoxicology is uh, quite narrow, but very, very interesting. Lots of receptors that we're going to dork out about today. Spoken like a true neurologist. What's your favorite receptor? I don't know that I have one. GABA does, GABA helps me in a pinch often. Oh, that's a good one. I'm going to go with 5H22. Uh, and my name is Dave, and I am a senior emergency medicine resident who's going to be an attending in 36 days and four hours. Um, so to not, not that I'm counting or anything, but I also do a ton of talks. The ER boards is full of talks. So you came to the right place if you wanna learn how to get all these questions right. Um, we're gonna tell you how to find the questions for talks, how to approach them and how to answer them. So. So without there, further ado, a little bit about who we are. We've been doing this for, oh God, it's 16 plus years now. Last month it was 15. So we must have had an anniversary recently. Um, we've been here for a long time. One-on-one um, -on -one online tutoring, pre-med through residency, through board exams. If it has something to do with high stakes medical exams or medical education or advising or anything, we do it. So bring your problems. And we are here and we're not just, you know, talking here. We actually work with students. Um, both Michael and I are active tutors um, and hang out with, uh, you know, some of the people that you see here who are also active tutors. So uh, we are real. Uh, wow, much talks. Much talks. Uh, Mike, what the, how do we approach a theoretical toxicology question on the step? Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, your earlier comment that they're kind of sneaky. They just creep in. They don't really fit in any one organ system, but all the ingestions and everything that we're going to talk about today tend to have some tropism for one organ system, or they just mess absolutely everything up and you have to figure out what's going on. Um, so we'll go through some hints, some things that are cluing you into a toxicology question. I think there are certain elements. I sometimes the younger patient who has fulminant disease makes me worry a little bit more about toxicology. Um, the, for better or for worse, sometimes when uh, questions contribute to some poor stereotypes and someone is unhoused and is very, very ill, I, I worry a little bit more about toxicology. Um, and then if someone has some occupation that they, they belabor, right? So they're a farmer, or they do this, or they do that, or they were recently out picking something, and then they became very ill. I worry a little bit more about ingestion. Um, I like to think about them, is there too much of something in this person's body or is there too little of something in this person's body and, and which one of those is causing the symptoms and how do you parse between those? And then hopefully uh, what we'll go through today are the most commonly tested toxidromes. As, as your boards will tell you, right, there are endless toxidromes and everything is terrible if you take it in enough of a dose, but we'll go through the ones that you're most liable to see. Awesome. I love it. And, you know, the way they approach some of these questions, and we're, we're not, we're, we're not going to beat this to the ground because we're going to do it here for the next hour or so. But like, they, you, you, I like what you said. It's tricky. It's tricky, tricky, tricky to quote. Um, oh, man, it's going to bother. Someone help me out. Um, but they're either going to either tell you that it's, there's a bottle found at the scene, but truthfully, it's the most common thing that I see in the ER. So someone comes in with a constellation of symptoms and a bottle was found in the back. So and that's how you think it's tox. And the other way they're gonna give it to you is they're gonna give you a classical toxidrome. And those are the tricky ones. Those are the ones that you're just gonna have to figure out what they're getting at. We're gonna tell you what to look for. 
So let's jump right into it with aspirin. So aspirin, if you remember, your mechanism is a irreversible non-selective Cox blocker um, that has antiplatelet effects. So aspirin, um, and let's make this interactive. So if you were expecting aspirin to be the answer for an overdose, what is the first unique sign or symptom consistent with aspirin toxicology? Let me take a sip of my water while I wait. Wow. They're, they're usually, you know, most overdoses they give fatigue, dizziness, uh, maybe shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting. Um, uh, What's it called? Uh, Shelly, you are correct in that it gives you a respiratory alkalosis followed by metabolic acidosis. The other thing that I was looking for, the first unique sign or symptom is tinnitus. So tinnitus. If you see tinnitus on an exam question, I want you to think, is this a, a subtle aspirin overdose? They'll give it to you all the time. 70 year old in a nursing home, tinnitus, chronic aspirin overdose. Uh, Shelly was correct. If you have a large scale aspirin overdose, you're gonna have a combined respiratory acidosis because, excuse me, respiratory alkalosis, because as Wayne points out, an increased respiratory rate because the salicyclic acid um, binds to the medulla and the pons causing an increase of respiration. Did I get that neural right? Close enough. Um, <laughs> And because it's a, a organic anion, it's going to increase your gap. So either they're going to tell you there's an ink, there's a bottle of aspirin, or they're going to give you a that that characteristic toxidrome, the uh, the high anion gap acidosis with a respiratory alkalosis. How do we treat it? How do we treat a aspirin overdose? Uh, what do y'all What do y'all think? Excellent. Elizabeth has nailed it right out of the park. Bicarbonate. Bicarbonate, what it does is it alkalinizes the urine so that the salicyclic acid, because it becomes the charged conjugate base form, and then it gets stuck in the urine, so you pee it out. If you're on step two or step three, you should know that your urine pH goal is 7.55 to 7.6. If it's a severe overdose, you can use dialysis for aspirin. If you're on step two, you're looking for an aspirin level of 100 or greater, or you're looking for seizure coma. That's typically when you, when you bust out the dialysis machine. So a subtle respiratory alkalosis gap acidosis is what it's gonna show up as. And you're gonna treat it with bicarb. And if it's really bad, you're gonna treat it with dialysis. Mike, what, uh, do you have any additional thoughts on aspirin? I don't, but I do, this, re this reminds me when you talk about tinnitus that or a lot of times we're talking about overdoses, that these are common meds. And so some other meds that you should think of that can cause tinnitus, right? So if you have someone who's on antiarrhythmic long-term, um, what's what's, which one are you implicating for tinnitus? My only other thought there. Nothing about aspirin, but I do like tinnitus. Anyone, if I give you the clue cinchinism, right, it's one thing to remember what cinchinism is. It's another to uh, remember that it can cause, yeah, good, quinidine, very good. Yeah, so any of the quinone groups can cause tinnitus, so that's my only thought there. And then uh, there was a question in the chat about the mechanism of dialysis, and I'm going to punt that one over to you or to yeah. a neurologist would be my So, I mean, it's, there's actually not a great answer here. It's just some medications are more dialyzable than others. Um, organic anions tend to be decently dialyzable. Um, and aspirin is, um, Carly, you will get the recording afterwards. Um, and what's it called? Uh, aspirin tends to be highly dialyzable. Things that aren't include heavy metals. You need chelators for heavy metals, but we'll get there. So that's the first one. Where there's aspirin, 
there's Tylenol. And buckle up because they love asking questions about Tylenol. Tylenol, it works as a theoretical COX inhibitor in the brain with less or minimal side effects in the periphery. Um, that's its theoretical mechanism. It's not, no one's quite sure. Um, but let's turn our attention to this diagram on the right. So you have acetaminophen, which is sometimes stylized as APAP. And the majority of your Tylenol gets at either glucuronid or sulfonate. So your, your liver has two ways to fix things. It either staples a moiety on it that makes it easier to pee out, or it does redox reactions. The majority, 85 to 90% of Tylenol metabolism is by adding either a glucuronidide or a sulfate group so that you can pee it out and it's more potent. The other 10-ish percent undergoes redox reactions with CYP450. That CYP450 is the 450 that's made famous by Warfarin and grape juice and everyone else. So that pathway makes a toxic intermediate called NAPK. NAPK doesn't last very long because glutathione, which is your all-purpose all stain remover in terms of hepatotoxic intermediates, comes and takes care of it right away. However, when you have two things happening, you can get a Tylenol toxicity. If you have a large enough Tylenol ingestion that you have overwhelmed the glucuronidation pathway, you will have what's ever left over going to napkin. So this top pathway, it gets saturated faster. And then any leftover goes through CYP450. So if you take a large enough dose of Tylenol, whatever is above that level will be made into toxic napkin. But that's not enough. You need to have enough toxic napkin to deplete your glutathione stores to 30% or less in order for there to be a buildup of this napkin. The napki is directly hepatotoxic and will, if in large overdoses, cause direct hepatic necrosis and fulminant hepatic failure. This marker on the left tells us when we should use our antidote of choice. What is our antidote of choice for Tylenol? Hint, it's on screen. Yeah. There it is. Perfect. Elizabeth, well done. NAC or N acetylcysteine. For bonus points, what's the most common side effect of NAC uh, administration? I'll let you all chew on that for a moment. Um, but yes, N acetylcysteine is very well tolerated. And what it does is it replenishes the stores of glutathione, thereby giving you your supply of detoxifying glutathione. And you will have to, if you're on step two or three, know how to read this nomogram, that you have to have a four hour mark. And if your four hour mark is above 150 or above this, this line here, then you give NAC. And the answer to the question, the most common side effect of N-acetylcysteine is an anaphylactoid reaction, a non-IgE mediated uh, anaphylaxis-like state, where you just stop the infusion, give some Benadryl, and then start the infusion at a slower rate. They don't hide. Tylenol overdoses a lot on the exam. So, uh, because there is, you know, there is no other test except for transaminitis that, that, would, be, that would show it. Classically, day one, Tylenol overdose, you have nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. Day two, you feel better. Day three, you're dying. You start to have fulminant hepatic necrosis. Did I miss anything big? Uh, Tylenol. It's a lot there. It's a big one. Big one. We started with some heavy hitters. So reminder, the, the Tylenol that you and I have when we have a headache, that mostly gets made into glucuronidide or sulfate. If small amount gets made into napki, but we have enough glutathione to handle it. If you take a large enough dose, you'll overwhelm your, your top pathway, making more napki, depleting your glutathione scores and, and causing hepatic necrosis. If you're above this line and you should know how to interpret 
they're going to give you a, a APAP level and they're going to make you plot it on here and say, do we need NAC or do we not need NAC? So, and what's it called? If for some reason you, they waited too long and they have fulminant hepatic necrosis, they need a transplant is the answer for that question. So, um, ooh, Auburn was a good question. The dose of uh, to be potentially toxic it depends, which is always the answer in tox. That's a little unsatisfying, I know. The smallest dose that can theoretically give you uh, hepatic toxicity in an acute setting is about seven grams for an adult, you are correct. So, or 150 milligrams per kilogram per child, but we're not gonna go into that. Uh, so uh, they will give you a number of pills. They won't do anything particularly fancy like that. I would be surprised if they give you chronic Tylenol overdose as well, because unlike aspirin overdose, there is no real defining symptom like chronic tinnitus to blame on. Um, excellent. So Mike, this is your time to shine for the neuro stuff, your, your favorite receptors. Uh, here. All, my, all my receptors here. So, here. Um, um, yeah, I think uh, when I often work with students, uh, all of the medicines that have impact on the cholinergic and anticholinergic system are a little bit overwhelming. They're a little bit dizzying if we're going to use a pun. Um, so I do like to just sort of really boil it down to, if you know the four, recept four, four main receptors and you have a, just a one word idea of what they do, you can kind of piece through what happens if those receptors are being overstimulated or they're being blocked and things will fall into place. So receptor breached approach, let's talk about receptors that are cholinergic, right? So acetylcholine acts on them. You have the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. And in general, you should think about that on muscle, right? Yes, it's in other spots, but think about it on muscle. The muscarinic acetylcholine receptor has five subtypes, right? Three of which are important and are testable. Um, the M1 receptors are in the brain, the M2 receptors are in the heart, and the M3 receptors do all of the wet and sticky things, all of the secretions all throughout the body. Now, in general, right, the only one that tends to trip people up is M2 on the heart. Does that make the heart beat faster or beat slower if I'm acting on the M2 receptor? Slower, good, right? So vagus nerve, parasympathetic nerve from the brainstem, right down to the heart, releases acetylcholine onto the SA node, which slows the heart rate. So people who have had a heart transplant and no longer have vagal innervation to their heart have a higher resting heart rate. So lots of interesting things about that, but um, toxicity, right? So too much cholinergic. Now, what people often do is sort of blend together lots of words, right? So they use cholinergic, they use muscarinic, they use all of these things all at once, right? And so when I say cholinergic, I mean acetylcholine binding to nicotinic receptors and muscarinic receptors. Um, the toxicity here is typified by organophosphate poisoning. So can someone remind me the mechanism of organophosphate poisoning? So pesticides, great. So that's, that's where I would worry about them, right? So the question I have someone who's working out in the field, child rolling around in the grass, somebody's doing something fun outside, and then they come in fulminantly ill, and we'll talk through all the symptoms, but why? Why pesticides? What do they do? What do they break? What's the mechanism of a pesticide causing too much acetylcholine in my body? So I see ACH receptor blocker, right? And this is why I like to be a little bit deliberate about this, because if I were blocking all of these acetylcholine receptors, I would have dry symptoms, right? I would be anticholinergic. So um, organophosphates inhibit and sort of destroy, if you will, acetylcholinesterase, the thing that breaks down acetylcholine. So if you get rid of the thing that breaks down acetylcholine, 
you have way, way, way too much acetylcholine. That is going to act on all of the muscarinic receptors and going through them one by one, it's not really going to make anyone's brain work better, right? I think that you probably know that being poisoned isn't going to help brain function. Too much acetylcholine on the heart is going to slow the heart down, causing bradycardia. And then in all of the other places is going to lead to all of the secretions, diarrhea, urination, bronchospasm, vomiting, sweating, emesis, salivation. So everything where you think about muscarinic overload. They're not listed on this, but if I overwhelm the nicotinic receptors, what kind of symptoms might those patients have? Good, muscle spasms, right? So you'll see someone with fasciculations. So someone who has acetylcholinesterase inhibitor problems from organophosphate, uh, then they're gonna have too much acetylcholine. It's gonna go everywhere, including to the muscles. That's also true when you give people things like succinylcholine, right? So acetylcholine and succinylcholine, very closely related from an organic chemistry standpoint, gonna cause diffuse fasciculations when you give it to someone. Um, so how do you treat these people? They're very sick. Actually, this is probably a better question. What's the first thing you do? So atropine and pralidoxime, I love it, right? Those are great answers. What's another good thing you should do, right? Someone comes in, it's a kid or a young adult, right? They were rolling around in the grass and you're suspecting that they have organophosphate poisoning. Yeah, take off their clothes. Yes, don't, don't let anything that could be still systemically absorbing into their skin continue to do that. Um, that is always the first step. And then atropine is the next. And so we'll talk about atropine on the next time when we talk about anticholinergics. But in general, you want to block all of the muscarinic effects. So atropine, right, being a muscarinic antagonist will help manage these things here. It will not do things like take away the stiffness and muscle spasms. And so for that, I need to reconstitute my acetylcholinesterase. I need my acetylcholinesterase back. I need to get this acetylcholine out of my body. And so that's why I use pralidoxine. There's a time sensitive and I would, David does this. I see these things afterwards and maybe take questions. Is it like within eight hours of poisoning or do I have that wildly wrong? So, so it's usually indicated in the first 24 hours but it's most effective in the first eight because the interaction between the sure. pesticide and the cholinesterase, yeah, it's yeah. not a covalent bond until it ages. When it ages, it's a covalent bond and pralidoxine no longer works. Yeah. Um, and I just want to take one second. I know we're talking about the cool talk stuff, but think about all of the drugs where cholinergic effects are used therapeutically, right? And so something very common in my field, right? So dementia, and I'm using things like denepazil and galantamine and rivastigmine, right? So those are acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. So similar to an organophosphate, I'm kind of more lightly raising acetylcholine levels, but those have side effects. The side effects of those are bradycardia and GI distress. And when you think about things on a receptor-based level, that should make sense, right? They're promoting acetylcholine in the brain, and that's good. We want that. But they're also doing it to the heart, which is not our favorite thing, and they're also doing it elsewhere. So whenever you come across lists of things, try and boil it back down to why that's happening rather than memorizing lists. It'll save you effort in the long run. Very popular mnemonics for muscarinic effects, right? The dumbbells mnemonic. Some people like the sludge mnemonic as well. Um, and yeah, I think we can move on and talk about anticholinergics. That'll just reinforce because it's so the There's a question real quick. Um, Auburn oh, says, in the field, Duodote has both. In real, real life, you just give them both. Like the Mark II sort of auto-injector, stuff like that that you see in like um, disaster medicine, stuff like that. You just inject them all at once. Only on the exam do you have to pick atropine and then pralidoxin. Uh, the, the timing doesn't really matter. Um, I actually had a pesticide overdose like a week ago. 
uh, it was a small Amish kid who got into a, um, uh, got into some sort of pesticide. And don't forget the basics. They came in and she wasn't deconned yet. She wasn't so immediately centered to the, like, not the fire hose, but almost the fire hose, just to, just to get the decon. So decon, atropine, pralidoxine, supportive care. What about the opposite? What about our anti colon Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I Again, I think one of the central tenets of studying for these exams, if you know one really well, then the other one is the other one, right? So if you are struggling to memorize these lists of symptoms and the mnemonics are overwhelming, memorize one really well, right? So know your cholinergics, right? like I said, know the, the wet and sticky, the muscarinic, right? Everything is, is leaking, you're salivating, everything. And then anticholinergic is just going to be the opposite. Um, in general, people use anticholinergic and anti-muscarinic pretty simultaneously. Right? We're, we're mainly focusing on the symptoms of muscarinic receptor blockade. The toxicity here is typified by people being poisoned by atropine, right? A, a really prominent anti-muscarinic agent. Um, also can be one where you see people out in the field, right? So don't anchor if you see someone coming in from gardening and assume that they're going to have organophosphate poisoning, right? Because your gardener can be handling things like jimson weed, which does have natural atropine and hyoscyamine and scopolamine and all of the gnarly anti-muscarinics in it. Um, which if you have someone who has an anticholinergic toxin and they're poisoned by it, how would you treat them? Right? So they're coming in, they're hot as a hair, dry as a bone, blind as a bat. We'll talk about why that is, and red as a beet, and mad as a hatter, and all of those things, right? So cholinergic muscarinic receptors are blocked everywhere. So how do I fix them? I want to give them acetylcholine, right? Yeah, Auburn says physostigmine. So much like organophosphates, right? Physostigmine is going to be an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. Why physostigmine? Why not peridostigmine or neostigmine or? So these get really confusing and really overwhelming, right? So if you see the, the, the suffix stigmine, then you should think about something that is blocking acetylcholinesterase. So it's raising acetylcholine levels. And if I have atropine that's blocking my muscarinic receptors, I want as much acetylcholine available as possible to try and bump that atropine off. Neostigmine and physostigmine do not work in the central nervous system. I'm sorry, neostigmine and peridostigmine, if, if I said that wrong. Physostigmine, right, the mnemonic is that it physo freely crosses the blood brain barrier, helps boost acetylcholine levels in the brain, in the CNS, and combat some of the anti M1 effects, right? Because remember, that's the big one in the brain. So, yes, physostigmine, sort of supportive care, those are the big management for atropine poisoning. I want to comment on pupils just because those are things that go everywhere, right? The derivation of sort of how we found out and why we use atropine ophthalmologically, right? So remember that it can be found up top that I have the picture here, right? In the nightshade plant, they used to take part of this, drop it in people's eyes, sometimes called the belladonna, right? I think it was in Italy. So belladonna meaning beautiful lady at the time, right? Feeling like large pupils were more beautiful than smaller pupils. So atropine drops for that reason. Um, we use atropine clinically for lots of things, right? It's in your ACLS algorithm for bradycardia. So remember M2 receptor in the heart, too much acetylcholine slows the heart down, block that receptor, heart rate comes up. But I will say that these things can be very problematic. I've given a pharmacology lecture that's called Benadryl is the devil, right? If you're dealing with something on a board exam and it's causing bad side effects and diphenhydramine is an answer, think about it, right? So anticholinergics are extremely notoriously used on the Beers criteria, right? So this is a list of meds that may be potentially harmful in older adults. Um, 
atrophy, right? So anticholinergic blocking the M1 receptor in the brain can lead to confusion, things like that. So there's some studies suggesting that chronic things like, that are viewed as routine and safe, like Benadryl can have a higher risk of dementia later in life. So anything about anticholinergic, these are huge categories and you're like, oh, you yeah, mentioned every man. It's unfortunate. Well, you know, these people spend years doing just anticholinergics and studying some of this. But yeah, you guys just need to know the basics of everything. We're just talking about how to treat it in some major one. So like um, Benadryl overdose is one that sometimes I'll see. Um, and hallucinations is, is a specific finding. Hallucinations and picking behavior. Uh, are in specific signs of Benadryl overdose as compared to some other one. Um, question from Shanzi, what is Beers? Beers is a set of medications by, I assume, Dr. Beers. Um, uh, oh, perfect. Uh, that, uh, yeah, that, that may cause um, orthostasis, delirium, and other problems um, in older adults. Most meds that you see your patients on will be on the Beers criteria. Yeah. Oh man, have we, we haven't taught them the toxicologist handshake yet, have we? Uh, I don't know the toxicologist handshake. Oh, the toxicologist handshake. Um, what you do is you walk up to someone and then immediately put your hand right in their armpit. <laughs> Why their armpit? Because if it's a anticholinergic, it's going to be dry. Mm. If it's sympathomimetic, it's going to be wet. Perfect. Uh, uh, so more about sympathomimetics. Yeah. Uh, what else and do you got? Different approach to sympathomimetics, right? Coming from a neurologist versus an EM is I, I want to know the I want to know the receptors, right? Which ones are being uh, antagonized here, or rather, which ones are being acted on? Um, which adrenergic, right? So think adrenaline, right? Which adrenergic receptors are going to be involved here? Is there a preferential effect between them? Tends to be less in things like toxidromes, right? But when we think about meds, because all these things are also meds, that's hopefully what everyone's recognizing. Um, typically in toxidromes and sort of toxic overdoses of sympathomimetics, the alpha effects predominate, right? So I think more about things like hypertension um, and I think less about things like vasodilation from beta predominant effects. Uh, mydriasis or uh, dilated pupils, right? So again, if I'm running away from a bear, I want as much light in my eyes as physically possible so that I can see the things that I'm trying to step over as I run. So I want my eyes to be dilated. So sympathetic effect is going to dilate the eyes. Um, when you think about sympathomimetics, right? So they're sort of typified, right? Some mostly for drugs of abuse, less so for other sort of happenstance things that you just happen to overdose on. But Medicines for ADHD or sympathomimetic, right? A lot of medicines that are used sort of in the ICU um, as part of routine medical care are sympathomimetics. Um, one thing that I always like to teach that I think is helpful to think about with the dose dependent on which receptors are going to be acted on is when I think about epinephrine and just think about your, your just life. With an EpiPen, right, I'm managing asthma. So lower doses of epinephrine is going to have predominant beta effects. I want my airways to open up. Higher doses of epinephrine, like I would use in the ICU as someone who needs pressure support, right? Those are going to have predominant alpha effects. Different receptors are going to have different dose-dependent things. That just helps me remember one of the bigger ones that gets tested. Question that pops up all the time in someone sympathomimetics, and we have a whole slide later about uh, drugs of misuse and drugs of abuse. But if someone comes in and they're agitated, they have dilated pupils, they're tachycardic, they have chest pain, maybe they're having a STEMI and David's figuring that out. How would you treat their blood pressure? Right, you're suspecting that they're, they're gonna be utox positive for cocaine. So benzos is a great choice to calm them down, which in theory may help their blood pressure. So the blood pressure meds you could use are calcium channel blockers. You could also use labetalol, even though it's a beta blocker, because it has alpha blocking properties as well. Labetalol is the ER doc's best friend. 
is, and you see my, I'm not, I'm, I'm no artist, but if I am a lowly norepinephrine that was released from a nerve because of cocaine, and I have the choice to latch on to all of the alpha receptors and tighten those blood vessels up or all of the beta receptors and open some vessels, then if you give someone who has done cocaine and the mechanism for their hypertension is too much norepinephrine, right? So too much adrenergic influence and you block their beta receptor, then all of the norepinephrine is going to saturate their alpha receptors and it's going to make their hypertension worse. Just a little I like it. picture correlate there. So before we go forward, any questions on this stuff, on the neuro, the, the receptor ones, cholinergics, anticholinergics, sympathomimetics. And again, I put a little fun fact there. Be careful because alpha-2 is a sympatholytic, even though it's technically sympathetic. So you're looking for bradycardia on a sympatholytic overdose, like clonidine or dexmedetomidine. <laughs> not tachycardia. Does that make sense to everyone? I guess, because that, that also is one that I see all the time, right? So if you have, I don't know, right? So if I have alpha receptors, right? Alpha one tends to be postsynaptic, right? So norepinephrine binds. And if I block it, of course, that blocks the effects. Alpha two is a presynaptic receptor and leads to the release of things, right? So, or to the, the not release of things. So it just messes people up with why it's the opposite. The way I like to think of alpha two is it, it functions as a break almost. It stops there from being too much secretion of other, um, other uh, neuro, neurotransmitters. So too much break means you're stopping and that means lowering blood pressure, lowering heart rate, stuff like that. Um, Toxic alcohols and heavy metal. All right, let's do it. Um, classically, if they want to give you a toxic alcohol overdose, these are a lot of times um, distilleries, uh, a lot of times homeless patients, a lot of times, uh, what's it called? Uh, poisonings stuff like that. Those are the things that your, your vignette is gonna give you to, to clue you in that you may have a toxic alcohol overdose. And the metabolism is also important here because most of them follow the same similar risk sort of pathway. You have an alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme that takes many of these and then um, turns them into something else. Usually it's the something else that is the dangerous one. So methanol, which the, on uh, the vignette is usually from someone who's making moonshine, um, ends up making formaldehyde, which is what they use to keep dead bodies fresh and whatnot. Um, and that is going to lead to methanol-induced retinitis. So blindness, blurry vision, and the signs and symptoms you look for. You treat it with fomepazole. Fomethazole is an alcohol dehydrogenase blocker that basically prevents the uh, metabolism so the methanol stays whole where it's not as toxic and just gets peed out. If you don't have fomepazole available, aka you're in a third world country or something like that, they still use ethanol to this day. Uh, some places have IV ethanol, and I've heard, you know, we have a couple docs who do like. Uh, mission trips and whatnot in Africa, they just give whiskey. Uh, and, you know, they keep them, they get them drunk for a couple of days because the ethanol will outcompete the, the from methanol for the alcohol dehydrogenase and they'll let the methanol de de get its way out of the system before they can sober them up, so to say. Ethanol is the one we all know and love. Uh, it becomes acetaldehyde. So ethanol is what makes you warm and fuzzy. Um, Alcaldehyde is what makes you pray to the, the porcelain gods. Um, and then it gets made into acetic acid, which is uh, vinegar, so that's not so bad. Um, what's it called? Um, ethanol can, can give you a, um, what's it called? A, uh, the things you're looking out for, the things that we all sort of know, disinhibition, 
disequilibrium, and dystaxia. Those are the signs of ethanol overdose. In severe, in severe terms, respiratory and cardiac depression. Um, largely, you just sleep it off. Ethanol is interesting that it's a zeroth order kinetics, meaning uh, if I have one shot and Mike has three shots, they're both going to be eliminated at the same rate. Unlike many drugs that have first order kinetics, aka the more drug, the more gets eliminated. So that and phenytoin tend to be your common zero order kinetic medication. Um, ethylene glycol um, becomes glycolic acid um, and that can become oxalic acid. That will, ethylene glycol is found in antifreeze that will give you oxalate kidney stones. That's the big one for ethylene glycol. Isopropyl alcohol gives you a, um, what's it called? Um, a non-acidotic osmolal gap because it turns into acetone. Acetone is the nail remover we all remember from Orgo Lab uh, that doesn't have an acid group. So if they give you something that looks like a toxic alcohol um, poisoning, and you can tell usually because there's increased osmolality, meaning there's a phantom, phantom organic anion there, uh, without acidosis, then you're thinking isopropyl alcohol. Um, flipping from toxic alcohols to heavy metal. So heavy metal, um, always think GI distress. Young kids who are eating paint um, off of old houses, uh, oftentimes they'll have autism spectrum disorder. Um, oftentimes the house will be from the 1940s and prior. Um, that And vomiting, abdominal pain, Chronic or unexplained abdominal pain in kids should be tested for lead because that's very common. If the lead levels are between 35 and 70, they get oral succimer. If they're 70 or higher or have neurologic changes, they get something bigger, uh, dimer uh, not dimercaprol, uh, having a brain fart. Uh, they get an IV chelator. Uh, what's it called? Iron gets desferoxamine as a chelator. Um, other heavy metals can get EDTA or British anti-lewisite as their chelator of choice. There's a lot of little details in toxic alcohols and heavy metals. So I recommend if you, if you don't have them cold, make them into flashcards because there's not a ton of concepts here, but there's a ton of individual associations that you have to memorize together. Like anything, anything to add on to toxic alcohols or heavy metal. I'm lagging behind in the ability to supply fun facts. Um, alcohol is a cerebellar depressant and toxin, which is why all of your roadside tests for DUIs are cerebellar tests. So watching someone's eyes move across, your eyes should be coordinated and people who don't have a cerebellum, their eyes will click past. So that's why that's one. And then walking with your feet in tandem is also a cerebellar test. So a lot of your bedside exams for cerebellar function are the exact same ones that someone will use at a DUI checkpoint. That's a good point. I never thought about that. Uh, street drugs. All right. Um, so we all know uh, opiates, classically heroin, morphine, dilaudid, fentanyl. The way that you're going to pick it up on an exam is by a low respiratory rate of like four or five or six. That's unlike most other things besides major trauma in that case. So if they have meiosis plus uh, bradypnea, get out what medication? What do we give for an acute heroin or fentanyl spiked overdose? Yes, Narcan, another, which is generic naloxone. We don't give naltrexone because it takes 30 minutes to work. By the times it works, they've already passed. Uh, naltrexone is great for alcohol and um, opioid uh, use disorders uh, longer term. Nal naloxone is now. Um, depressants, alcohols, we're going to talk about withdrawal syndromes next, so I'll leave that. Um, but basically, if it's a downer, your withdrawal is going to be up. If it's an upper, Withdrawal is going to be down. 
It's, uh, if you've never seen Wolf of Wall Street, it's a great movie. It reminds me of uh, Leonardo DiCaprio trying to chase his quaaludes with uh, cocaine in order to even them out. Uh, so what's it called? Um, high doses of depressants, you're gonna have cardiorespiratory depression and you gotta watch out for that. Benzos, barbs, especially if mixed with alcohol can lead to life-threatening bradypnea. Stimulants like cocaine, amphetamines, uh, stuff like that, up, up, up and away. One way to pick out the difference between cocaine overdose and uh, methamphetamine overdose is coke lasts for about an hour in terms of its duration. Meth lasts for almost a day in terms of its duration. So if they're still, if they're still ramped up high in four hours, it's probably meth and not cocaine at that point. Cannabis, um, one question that comes up more recently is cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. Um, to keep matters short, um, cannabis normally causes an anti-emetic effect, which is why it's great for cancer. But if you use too much, or you know, too fast, too furious, a lot of it every day, it will switch the receptor, the vanilloid-like receptor, and it will become pro-emetic and you will barf 20 times a day. Like, I don't know if you've never seen, if you've ever seen a marijuana hyperemesis syndrome. Oh yeah, you've, you'll never see it. You, you never see anything like it. Uh, they, they're just, they look, they're like 25, but they look like they're, they're dying. They're not actually dying. They're just vomiting so much. Does anyone so, know the history question that helps you parse out whether or not patients will tell you they feel better in a very particular environment? No, uh, this is a great question. And if it's on there, it's so specific. Beautiful. Auburn uh, and Wayne from the corner three, Curry style. Uh, hot shower. Hot shower activates the capsaicin receptors, which are theorized to downregulate the vanilloid um, activity causing it, which is why you can also rub capsaicin cream on their bellies. And that also helps. So. Uh, all right, withdrawal syndromes. The biggest one being alcohol. How do we parse out the different stages of an alcohol withdrawal? Yeah, and uh, David summarized it very excellently, right? So anything that's a downer, the withdrawal is going to be autonomic hyperactivity, right? So the person's going to be agitated, tachycardic, hypertensive. Um, and then stimulant may or may not have a withdrawal syndrome, but people generally don't feel great. They feel pretty down. Um, so I think the things that are helpful for me, because sometimes that you're like, the question will be like, is this person withdrawing from X or intoxicated with Y? Um, and it's hard to figure out which is which. I skip a lot of the things in the question and look particularly at pupils and vital signs. Um, a lot of them are gonna have some mild, but if you have really, really significant tachycardia and hypertension, you should be thinking, right, either stimulant intoxication or depressant withdrawal. Stimulant intoxication should give you big pupils. Depressant withdrawal, not a very impressive pupil exam. So if I'm trying to really distill a question down into like one or two things to look at to keep my mind centered, those are two really good ones. Um, we'll talk specifically about stages of alcohol withdrawal. And before I do, which withdrawal syndromes can be fatal? Important to know, right? Most patients who are going through withdrawal are uncomfortable. Yeah, every, Elizabeth, Auburn, Wayne, everyone, Ali, excellent. So alcohol, yeah, so alcohol, and then I'll add in benzos, right? Because they, they're similar in sort of mechanism of action. Those two withdrawal syndromes can be fatal. Um, opioid withdrawal is very miserable. People are in immense pain um, and have symptoms that make them feel like they're dying, uh, but it itself is not inherently fatal. Um, so alcohol withdrawal, the timing of the last drink matters. That's a great history question. If you're starting your EM or your IM clerkship, and you're trying to parse through how worried do I need about this patient and my sign out to the oncoming provider, the time of last drink is going to be really helpful. So early on in withdrawal, you think about things like tremor and irritability, um, minor shakes. Early on, you can have 
alcohol withdrawal seizures, which are managed with benzodiazepines, which is the symptomatic management of alcohol withdrawal. As you move forward, typically somewhere near the 72 hour mark, I think that's often what's quoted, right? I worry about delirium tremens, right? So that's sort of a more fulminant encephalopathy with seizures, then that's the fatal aspect of alcohol withdrawal. So pay attention to the time because that's often the clue, less so the symptomatology, right? Tremor, hallucinations, agitation, that all can get mixed in there. Timing is key. So I like this, this chart. Make however you, you, know, you need to remember to hone in on how long has it been since they've last drank. Uh, alcohol withdrawal, sort of cornerstone of management, right? So you have your short acting benzodiazepines, things like lorazepam. And then also remember you can use longer acting benzodiazepines, things like chlorodiazepoxide or Librium, which sort of will slowly help. You don't want to give someone high dose benzos and then stop because then you will precipitate a benzo withdrawal. So you have to be a little nuanced with how often you give people things. Beautifully said. And in fact, when you guys get to the clinic, there exists paper packs of this stuff. I've sent people home on Librium paper packs, which is chlordiapoxide. And it just ramps itself down to prevent that benzo withdrawal. Miscellaneous. Oh, look at all this you stuff. Added in, you added in bruxism. That's a good one. Uh, if you yeah. see vertical nystagmus, the answer is PCP. Oh, yeah. That's, that's a great one. So I forgot about that. If, if they just fought five cops and everyone at the bar, it's probably PCP. Anything, uh, yeah, Albert, or rotary. Anything other than horizontal nystagmus is bad. Rotary, yes. Rotary is, is another one. It always makes me laugh, too, because if they're on PCP, I don't get that close to look at their eyes. So it's a poor <laughs> life choice. Uh, I, talks is fun. I mean, this this could this slide could have been a trillion different things. I think that are interesting, but I, I, just a couple ones that sometimes pop up that are, I don't know, interesting. So if you smell, if someone has almonds, almond scented breath, smells like almonds, you should think about cyanide poisoning, right? The way that that typically shows up in questions is actually in the management of hypertension. Anyone know what I'm getting at there? Hmm. How can, how can I cause someone to have cyanide poisoning in the hospital if I'm fixing their blood pressure? Rude. Good. Every, oh, everyone's all over it. Yes, sodium nitroprusside, right? So IV infusion um, can lead to accumulation of cyanide. And so I think we could have an entirely separate webinar on methemoglobinemia and cyanide poisoning and all of the different oxygen dissociation curve abnormalities that you can get. Uh, Garlic, yes, please. Yeah, I, I would love to do David and I, hey, we'll talk after yeah. this. Yeah. Hawks and the Hound too. Hawks and the Hound too. Yeah. Um, garlic is typically associated with arsenic. Uh, and then again, sweet smell, right? I think we all know it for DKA, but some of the toxic alcohol ingestions that David was talking about earlier, sometimes the patients will be described as having a sweet or fruity odored breath. Um, you did heavy metals, I added, because I a lot of these actually do, in the more chronic toxicity, end up in my world. Right, so manganese poisoning long term can cause Parkinsonism and all of the things like Wilson's disease and all of the heavy metal depositional disorders tend to go after the basal ganglia. There's a couple more specific things that I've found helpful to me over time. Um, you already mentioned lead poisoning, constipation, difficulty concentrating, anemia, those are big ones. Arsenic tends to cause things that are wrong in people's skin and fingernails. Um, so if you're in neuropsychiatric disease, which I think is less specific, but if they highlight, I can't remember what they're called. There's something with an M, the arsenic things, they do some weird things. Oh, yeah. Look at it, well done. Oh, Lanes please. all over it. These bees. Uh, and then mercury, right, neuropsychiatric. And then again, if I see sort of them highlighting kidney, I tend to think more mercury. Um, these pictures are just fun. Can I touch, eat either of those things and, and why not, right? I think that uh, I the figure, on uh, radiology right, our left, uh, so the death cap mushroom um, would cause sort of a fulminant renal and hepatic failure. The as alpha amantinin is the toxin there. It messes up with RNA polymerase. Excellent job, Wayne. You know your toxicology. Um, and it causes all of my systems to go south. Uh, and on the right, so pufferfish, I guess cooked incorrectly ingestion of some 
most notoriously the puffer fish can lead to tetrodotoxin poisoning, which is a sodium channel blocker. And again, I like receptors. When you block sodium channels, bad things happen to your brain and to your heart, things that are extremely dependent on electricity. Um, so just summarizing it there. And then I think you contrast tetrodotoxin poisoning to the other one that starts with C, this is Sig Siguan, I don't Wait, know. Yeah, that one. And that does yeah. too oh. much opening of the sodium channels. So yeah. Sigwatera, look for a reversal of cold, warm sensation, mm, as that's well right. as teeth loosening sensation. It's very weird. That is the a weird one as well is um, red tide. Uh, red tide causes um, opening of sodium channels. Well, that's tested, not nearly as much. Uh, and that, again, these, these lists could be. There's so many, man. There's so many good ones. Tox is a whole fellowship. Yeah. Uh, um, all right, we'll do we'll do a couple. Y'all have been knocking the questions out of the park that we've been asking out loud, so this should be a no brainer. But something a little more uh, UM, USMLE written in style. Um, David, we may have different approaches to questions. I'm I'm always locked in on the first one. I want to know how old they are, how sick they are, and what their symptoms are. And then I usually actually skip to the question in a longer stem. Um, so I have a 25 year old, right? So I'm sort of my earlier inclination, and if they're very sick, I tend to think a little more likely tox, who's coming in with altered mental status, right? That's a pretty good tox stem. Um, he's found down, great tox stem. I don't have a past medical history, great. So he's afebrile, right? That doesn't count. His blood pressure is normal. His pulse is normal, both important to me. His respiratory rate is five. His oxygen saturation is 91. Um, so abnormal respiratory status with no abnormalities of his blood pressure or his pulse. He's being resuscitated. What else am I going to find on his exam? So two-step question, right? Step number one, what did he take and what clues can I use from the question to get there? Step number two, which of those is associated with the drug? Um, so drug, opiate, absolutely. Um, and the finding that people are putting in the chat, right? So meiosis or tiny pupils. Um, the other thing that I like to do and sometimes in these questions is look at the answers and then you know which drug they are, right? So ataxia would be alcohol, conjunctival ejection would be marijuana, meiosis would be opioids, mydriasis would be stimulants, and nystagmus would be PCP as we talked about earlier, um, some other things, but PCP probably for a, a drug question. And then, match those to the story, right? Rather than trying to, to work through, right? If you know kind of the quick ones, you can work, work backwards here. So um, minus this, absolutely. One more, what do we got? We have a 25-year-old uh, uh, man brought to the ED by police. He was found at a local celebration acting very strange. Oh man, it sounds like my Saturday nights. Um, and was reported by other patrons of the event. Uh, very anxious, hesitant, denies any substance abuse, just trying to have a good time, man. Uh, patients' responses are slightly delayed, difficulty processing his thoughts. Very anxious, would like some meds to calm down, history of psoriasis. Uh, temp is fine, BP is fine, pulse is a little tachycardic, rest are fine, sats are fine. He's an anxious young fella. HE in town, um, exam, dry mouth, contractival injection, cranial nerves are normal, um, grossly intact, all that good stuff, tachycardia, everything else is fine. What is going on? I agree, Ollie. This is, this is White Castle Syndrome, uh, also known as marijuana ingestion. So this what the treatment is largely just supportive care. It's nothing to do. I once had a dad bring his uh, kid, who was like 15 or 16, to the ER just for marijuana ingestion. No symptoms. Just wanted to teach him a lesson. Very expensive lesson. Thank you, Shelly. Thank you for picking that up, that reference. Um, but yeah, so uh, excellent. Do you guys or gals have any questions before we get to the Q&A? 
So we're gonna talk about ourselves for a couple seconds. This is the stuff we do, and I think we do a pretty good job at it. Um, so if you're interested in anything and working with either of us or any of our, our fine feathered friends, um, then you know, feel free to reach out to us. We do things as simple as making schedules to building entire large, you know, month to year long plans, content review, uh, admissions and residency consulting. If it exists, I'm sure we have a possibility of figuring it out. Um, but yes, now it's time for the question and answer session. Do any of y'all have any questions right now? And if you don't, and you just wanna say, this was great, or this stank, or anything in between, um, feel free to speak or just tell us your favorite receptor. Now, uh, everyone's got a favorite receptor. Conjugal injection is a fancy word for red eyes, Katie. So if you've ever seen someone on the marijuanas, they just, it's that, that characteristic red, uh, bloodshot appearance uh, without actual like inflammatory changes or tears or anything like that. No. All right, Michael, do you have any parting thoughts while we let our friends um, uh, put up their stuff in the chat? Uh, yeah, I'm seeing no other burning questions in the chat. David has answered everything, supplied more fun facts than I know what to do with myself. Uh, <laughs> learned a lot, a lot of fun. Uh, thanks everyone for being here with us. Yeah, thanks for everyone for coming. And again, just remember, you know, Toxa, toxas is, is highly represented on the exam. They make great flashcard questions um, to, to study for. And with a little bit of, of review, you will get all these points right. So it's kind of like you're a detective, you're like Sherlock Holmes. Um, so thank everyone for coming. Thank you for everyone who's putting nice words into the chat. Um, this is the first time we've ran Tox in the House. We're excited that it got a good response. We'll have to figure out how to, how to do more. Um, maybe there is more Tox fit to print. Um, everyone have a lovely evening and we'll be back. Um, we'll be back at the next one. So have a good night, everyone.